Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, one second. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, a, a very important screen minimized right when I went live. So hopefully you guys are doing good uh, or doing well, rather. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a couple of things real quick, and I shall be right back. <clears throat> All right, good. So now that I'm here, uh, see if audio is good. I About 10 minutes in, I realized my mic wasn't set up, and then a couple things were also uh, loose, and I didn't know how to connect them, so I <laughs> needed some assistance. Um, uh, of course, from my wonderful prof, but if it sounds good, that's good. I'm going to keep the door open, the bedroom door open, so it uh, might be a little bit reverberant, um, uh, but uh, I realized, it, I think it's 80 degrees outside. I haven't been outside all day, and so um, we've got that going, and I uh, had the heat on the whole time, and so it's it's been kind of muggy, so um, now we have the dehumidifier on, so it should cool me down some, and Let's see. Well, I had my notes on my other computer. <laughs> uh, I might just I might just do impromptu today. So anyway, hopefully you guys are doing well. Uh, we're going to be talking about art and cultural relevance. I'm going to switch on the camera in just a second, and then we shall welcome the chat. Okay, let's see how this looks. Okay, got got the microphone kind of close. We'll, we'll see how that is. But uh, yeah, every, everything's kind of, well, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's chaotic. Let's just say a lot of things are chaotic behind this computer here. So anyway, um, hopefully you guys are doing well, looking beautiful and clear. That's good. That's good. So how are you guys doing? Um, I'm doing great. I actually... It's, it's been, before we get into cultural relevance and art and all that, um, it's been kind of a week. It's been a good week. It hasn't been a bad week, but all week I was doing taxes, which before I got married, you know, it was, it took me about a couple hours, really easy. Um, and also prof, it, it really didn't take any uh, time at all after I got used to helping another person. So it was, it was taxes, uh, this week, which is great. And, um, but because of that, I, I didn't really have any uh, time to do uh, anything creative. I didn't I, I didn't compose like almost all week. I started composing yesterday, Saturday. So I'm look, I'm really looking forward to uh, composing uh, this coming week. Uh, now that all the stuff is taken care of, we also um, in the last few days we've we've also you know we la live out in the country and we've we've had some mouse trouble in the last couple of days. So that that's been fun too. So it's just a week of mice and taxes. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to creativity into this next uh, week. But today I, I for, for the little time I had, uh, not that little, uh, just a couple hours, I, I had a good, a pretty good writing stint with my work. So that was fun. So let's see, let's see who's in the chat. Excuse me. Uh, Let's go all the way back up. Uh, I had a couple comments before uh, Brian's comment, but I'll just say Brian is first. Uh, I wonder what it means for art to be culturally relevant. Well, we'll get to that. I, we'll see if I can get to that with, with my notes. So, or without my notes, rather. I, I, might, I just might have it memorized my, my thoughts just all the way up here and just speaking uh, as we go. Welcome to you, Brian. Welcome to Ghost Planet. Uh, Max Inc. 1.0. Good to see you. Junk is with us. Nathaniel's with us also. Good to have you guys. Uh, you say junk. I hope, by the way, I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> That's how we read it. That's how we read the word over here. Um, usually when someone uses the term culturally re relevant on the internet, this usually translates to a modern problem that is deemed worse than anything else that uh, has been historically occurred. Yeah, we're gonna, I I'm gonna approach this idea, this, this, I had my question pinned too. Maybe it wasn't on StreamYard, but maybe you can see it on YouTube. I don't have YouTube up, uh, but uh, I, I do have the question, should art be culturally relevant? And we'll get into that soon. So, 
So let's see. Oh, you're continuing. I'm sorry. One second. We got Lynn Green with us. Good to have you. All right. Looks like you'll be here uh, tonight since uh, are in. That's good. I, are you traveling, Lynn Green? Good to see you. Uh, so junk, you do say you continue. However, that is rarely vindicated because it's rarely seen through an objective lens, which is why the notion is uh, usually tossed by the wayside after a year or two. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm not going to pin down everything about cultural relevance in this stream. I mean, this could probably be its own discussion board or blog set of blog posts could be a set of videos. I mean, um, I'm just going to like pretty much scratch the surface uh, with, with this. Um, but I, I have some also strong opinions on it too. Final Fantasy, welcome. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> Professor Geek says, it's hot in there. Yeah, my side or not my side, but the apartment we opened up, you know, eh, the heater was on and I wasn't paying attention. And it was funny because when I went over to the other side, it was nice and cool. I was like, oh, it feels good in here. And and I had realized I, I didn't, I didn't realize I was heating up because I'm so used to liking being hot, liking being warm. So, oh, well, Sammy Proctor, good to see you. Good to, good to have you. We got, uh, we have a dig outlaw, nine breaker, also good. Uh, <laughs> all right, good. You guys are catching up on some writing and drawing. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. So, um, let's see it. I'm going to open up my computer here real quick. I hope nothing disconnects. Can I? There we go. Ah, oh, it has that blue, blue face on it. We'll see. We'll see how that looks. I can't even access a lot of it. We might just, uh. You know, I just might turn off my computer. Thank you guys for hanging out while I do this. Uh, always appreciate it. Oh, okay. That's that's not so bad. Okay, I can see my notes in the corner behind my phone. So we'll, we'll probably do that. Let me see if I can just... Yeah, that's a little better. I, I think I can work with that. So my, I have my notes up there. And uh, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, Final Fantasy uh, asks, asks the question, does art need to be cultural, culturally relevant? No. Unless you're to become a fad, which is one letter away from fade. <laughs> it's destined to fade away. Oh, wait, no one is aware that trends come and go. Yeah. Okay. So some of you, so it sounds like a couple of you guys, I'll, I'll just, you know, uh, put the argument forward here. From a couple of the comments, I, I, I do see that um, some of you might think culturally relevant is more on the line of trends, what's popular, what's mainstream. And that can be true. That can be true. But I, I do want to put forward all my arguments under this premise. When I say culturally relevant, I don't mean just for the moment. I don't mean just for the year, like the current year thing or the current day thing. I actually do talk, I, I mean, just to put a simple example um, out, out there, something like Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings was created, I think, in the 60s, or at least it was published in the 60s. And it's been a, a dominant presence, culturally speaking, forever, you know, for the last handful of decades. And so something like the Lord of the Rings story is a fine example of cultural relevance. It's, you know, at one point or another, it's all always on someone's mind. Uh, it could be at a dinner table. It could be, you know, recently revisiting, uh, I think the Return of the King in theaters. I think my mom went to go see Return of the King again, because there was a showing last year or something. I, I think that's what it was. And, and, and people would still go see Lord of the Rings or, or read Lord of the Rings. You know, people in general, maybe once in their life or once a year or somewhere in between, They'll go back to the books. They'll go back to the Lord of the Rings stories. Uh, they'll maybe not to a, a, I would say to a smaller extent, they would go to the history and the lore of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, those movies, I know more than a handful of people watch those movies frequently because they're just really well done. So my whole stream is under that premise is that culturally relevant is something that that sticks with you or sticks with culture. Uh, for better or for worse, in, in the case with Lord of the Rings, it is for the better because it's 
It's a good story. It's a lot of good themes and a lot of good values upholding uh, tradition, a good storytelling, character development, and all that. So that's where I'm coming from as far as being culturally relevant. Now you could say an example, uh, someone who is currently culturally relevant is Taylor Swift. Now, will she remain as famous as she is now 10 years from now or when she's old and gray? Likely not, but as far as her her clout, shall we say, like her, her musical presence and her showmanship, yes, pretty much everyone, everyone knows who she is. Not everyone listens to her music. Not everyone knows what she sounds like, but people know. She's she's part of the culture. She's uh, part of that vibe. So I'm not saying that's better or worse uh, for, for our culture, but you can pinpoint different examples. Now, Taylor Swift is a very current example. I mean, I might be dating this video five years from now or something. I don't, people don't really watch old live streams anyway, but, uh, you know, she's a current day example. She's a current year example, but maybe that's going to change five to 10 years from now. Disney, for instance, the company has been culturally relevant forever, you know, since the inception of something, someplace like Disney World. Uh, as far as the trajectory where Disney is going, and as far as the, the magical kingdom and storytelling, well, if they don't, if they don't pursue what's pretty much been the foundation, that, that bedrock of why Disney the man himself and then also his creation, you know, Disney World or whatever. Uh, if, if, if the bedrock is not there, then I, I do believe the company Disney will go. It will it will pass along by the wayside, never to be seen again. Uh, but that's going to be a long, slow decline. For better or for worse, Disney is culturally relevant. So that's, that's the theme of my stream, should art be culturally relevant. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a drink of water real quick and then ask that question again and then give you my give give you my answers again this is this is uh uh i'm just scratching the surface this is more impressions and ideas oh goodness my there we go uh i was my nose were about to black out okay so <clears throat> Uh, they're not, uh, before I begin, these notes aren't too long, but I could go on little sidebars depending on, on how I, how I talk, hopefully not. But then once I'm done with the notes, we'll get into the chat and see what you guys have to say. All right. So <clears throat> should art be culturally relevant? Now, the very short answer is no, only because art in and of itself is a good thing. Whether you have art or you make art art in and of itself is a good thing. This could be for an extremely personal use or, or a personal purpose like self-enrichment. Uh, this could, you know, you could um, showcase a piece of art. Maybe you're drawing a, a portrait of a family member and that art piece only remains in the house of that relative to be seen by family members and friends and say, oh, this, my, my relative here uh, drew this wonderful portrait of me. So, so that, that is, a, if it's well done, uh, that that's, or has a certain style or, um, a degree of merit, then, then that is a piece of art. And that's more for an, you know, more enclosed environment, you know, a smaller environment to be seen by a very close circle of friends and family. So that, that alone is a good thing. So that piece of art, that portrait, if you will, of that family member doesn't have to be, you know, seen, virally speaking, you know, on online, on the internet, um, or, or just be put on the news, you know, the mainstream news, it doesn't have to be culturally relevant. Uh, one sec, <laughs> got these pop-ups. Ah, I can't use my mouse. All right. All right. Good. All right. So, so yeah. So if you, if you make art or if you have a piece of art that is for your own personal enrichment, that alone is good. So the first answer, the, the simple answer I would say is, is no. Art doesn't have to be culturally relevant. Now, I would posit this idea with another question, and that is, should we have culturally relevant art? 
And I would say the answer is yes. I, I think it's important that whatever affects us, culturally speaking, you know, keeping up with traditional values, um, good good morals, uh, the, the good themes, uh, the iconic archetypes, all of those things that that keep us in a very good place um, as, as far as uh, the human experience and as, as part of the civilization, either or or both. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. But on the whole, what is good for humanity is art. You know, as, as medicine is good, as commerce is good, art is also good for humanity and the human experience. So I think it would be very important to have culturally relevant art, uh, to have good art to inspire not just one person, but but people in general as a whole. So having art that is culturally relevant is important. Art, again, I, I wanna stress that in and of itself, it, it's, it's okay to have art for your own personal enrichment, but to, to go beyond your personal experience to the human experience that could be shared by other people, I would say, yes, I think, having culturally relevant art out there is important. I want to approach this with a couple, you know, approach this at a couple angles and then maybe have a, a, a concluding question and then we'll go into the chat. So uh, the, the first angle is from the academic perspective. And by that, I mean historical art, art that has been, uh, historical art forms. Uh, some of them in, in current days are facing a decline. Uh, you know, some academics are using the words dying or passing away or passing on. And one of those art forms is a musical art form called the opera. And, you know, we all know what an opera is or what an opera looks like. You don't have to have seen an opera or know any of the repertoire to understand. Okay, opera is a musical drama that besides something like recitative, which is a, a singing kind of speaking, it is more of the aria. It's more using the traditional uh, beautiful voice to convey a, a character's a character and a character's story, a conflict and a resolve. So it's it's an act. Well, it's a, usually in a three act structure, or, or tradi traditionally speaking, it's three to five acts, depending. Um, depending on what region of um, Europe, in, in particular, I'm thinking of Western opera, um, uh, Western European opera, depending on where that was, what time it was, and, you know, the, the setting it was composed and, and produced uh, d does depend structurally, structurally speaking. I can't speak. <laughs> uh, sometimes it is one simple act or multiple acts, um, but we do have kind of that three act, you know, rise uh, intention, exposition, rise intention, the concluding act, and maybe a denouement, but not really. It's usually a concluding act, whether comedic or tragic. Um, so you don't have to know all that to know what opera looks like. Um, you also might understand that opera, at least as an art form, it's been mostly in the European uh, setting, the Western European particularly uh, uh, Italy, Germany, uh, France, and some of England for, I think, some of the earlier operas. So that's opera. And some academics I was listening to in an in interview, it's, pretty, it's actually pretty uh, revealing, this, this interview between two academics. I think one is a professor. He might, I don't know if he is a professor, but at least he's within the academic space. And he's, I, he's either a musicologist or a composer, maybe one of the two. He did interview another academic who she was. She was a musicologist, and they they were talking about opera and how um, the opera that that musical art form is dying. Now there are reasons for this. Now there are probably a plethora of reasons for this. I do want to cover a few of these reasons because I think I think it's important. Um, one reason why opera might be going out, as far as uh, our culture is concerned is that the patrons, the, the people, the attendees who, who pay for the ticket, who go see the opera, they are by and large old. Um, the average, I, I think they were throwing out the age like 60 years old and up, meaning the younger crowd, at least in you know today's terms, not as interested. I mean, the, the, there are, well, I mean, 
some people have to be young to be an opera to sing, you know, so there maybe the the younger crowd is actually the performers themselves or or the symphony orchestra musicians who are playing in the pit orchestra and the like. But as far as attendees, people who do attend the opera, the show are by average, it's an older demographic. So that's a problem. If the older demographic passes away and the younger crowd isn't interested, then that's, that is a definite decline of opera as an art form. Another reason is, um, you know, government sponsors, not sponsors, but uh, government uh, funds some of these uh, performance arts, uh, these, these, whether it's the actual performance uh, venue, like, like the stage, the amphitheater, uh, the, the, the concert hall, whatever the case is, you know, uh, it's not all, it's not completely subsidized by government depending. Uh, but if, if it is a huge contribution, you know, if the government is a contribution to the performance arts, like opera, for instance, well, that's also a problem because the government funding is limited. If there's a, if there's a crisis in some country or in some state, you, you know, here in the United States, that, you know, art can be the first thing that, that that's pulled out as far as um, budgetary things. So not really good if, if you have an older demographic who pays for it and then, you know, government funding. Well, those those two things are quite limited. And then one reason I'll also, I'll also uh, bring up as far as our opera dying as an art form is that this academic was talking about how uh, the, the new operas. So you, you got the 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 pinnacle of you know the the cream of the crop of the operas is 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 those of Mozart, Puccini, Verdi, Wagner. I'm I'm only naming a few, uh, but those are the major opera, the major players in opera. You cannot I honestly I can say this <laughs> having uh at least through a film and listening to it on a CD, you can't really go wrong. You can't really go wrong with a Mozart opera. Uh, Magic Flute is an opera that I recommend, especially with uh, Aria, uh, Queen of the Night, the Aria. Oh, so good. It's, it's a very mythical story. It's, it's a wonderful story. Uh, but Puccini's op operas are beautiful. Verdi's operas are really dramatic, especially his later operas. Uh, very Shakespearean. He's, he's done two Shakespeare, uh, two operas based on Shakespeare. Um, so, so people could possibly be very impressed with an opera that was composed in the 1700s and the 1800s, getting slightly into the 1900s. But by 1900s, it, it, it takes a turn for, for more modern uh, approaches to opera. Now, the thing with new operas, so people, so maybe contemporary music composers have this, um, they, they, they strongly desire to compose an opera. Oh, the art form is dying. We've got to compose new operas. Well, the problem is one of this, one of these academics uh, in the interview, he was complaining that a lot of operas that he's seen, this was in a common section, actually, um, they, they're terrible. He was very candid. He says, these new operas suck. They, they just don't work with the traditional voice and the traditional function of how a human voice should work. Because, and I'll say this from my own experience in the academic world, a lot of people in the contemporary music scene or the modern or even postmodern music scene, we call it contemporary music. We also call it new music. We, I'm not an academic anymore, but the academics do say new music or contemporary music. The, the, the new music composers, they work with voice, not in the traditional way. They work with voice as though voice is an instrument to be pushed, like to have, like to push the human voice beyond all boundaries. Hans Zimmer did that too with Dune. Now th that in and of itself is not a problem, but when you're working with the, the medium that is opera, when you're working with the art form that is opera, you need to use the, the human voice as the voice, not as an instrument to blend with any music ensemble, but in opera, the voice, it, the human voice is the central role. And not only that, not only is it the central role, it takes an elite set of skills to sing opera. You can sing in the chorus, you can sing in a, a choir of any kind or a cappella. but if you're an opera singer, you have an elite set of chops. And because new music composers don't work within those parameters, because they make the voice sound just like any other instrument, like a flute or some instrument that requires breath, then the music can, in and of itself can be boring for that reason. 
it, it could be, uh, he described, he used the word shapeless, this, this academic, he says, everything sounds so shapeless now when you're not working with the traditional function of the human voice. And this is an academic. This is, it was really refreshing to hear an academic say this because he's, he's an advocate for new music. He's an advocate for contemporary modern music. So I named a few reasons why the opera as an art form is dying, um, at least by, by the words of these academics. And the same is true, I'll give a couple examples, um, a couple more examples, but the same is true for symphonies. Now symphonies, the symphony orchestra is not on the decline. I don't think as fast as opera. There's, I would say in general, people find it a lot more agreeable or feasible to go to the symphony than they would going to an opera because the, the concert length is probably the same, but there's some, there's a huge amount of attention that you need for something like an opera. You're going to be emotionally invested in the characters in, in the music and you might be uplifted or you might, you go into the opera probably with the expectations of being emotionally, you know, take, take, you, know, you walk out emotionally thinking, man, I just read that really tragic book or I saw that really tragic film. Whereas with a symphony, you can have absolute music. We call it absolute music where there's no program. There's no, there's no, there are no words. There's no images. There's no idea behind the music. It could be like uh, Berlioz Symphony, Symphony Fantastique where there are images, but going into the orchestra, you're, I would say it's a it's a more cerebral cerebrally feasible experience to listen to a, a Mozart symphony or Beethoven symphony or a Brahms symphony uh, or even a Brahms violin concerto. You it's easier. And, you know, I, I, I know this. It's this is a little arbitrary, but not many people prefer the opera. And that could be one reason. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but you are more emotionally invested or more committed uh, when seeing an opera. I think um, it, it's not a bigger event per se, you know, compared to the symphony, but it's just people do prefer seeing the symphony than the opera. So the symphony is not on the decline as much. Also uh, the symphony orchestra, even the major philharmonic, like, like, um, you know, the Chicago symphony or Berlin philharmonic. I mean, these, these people, these cream of the crop orchestras of all the world, they will do video game music and they will do film music. Those concerts are what's keeping the younger demo demographic interested. It's, it's, it's an all age kind of thing. Um, the orchestra really in the last couple, I would say the last couple of decades, um, they, they can't keep the funding up with, with something like Brahms or Beethoven or Bach or, well, orchestra is not really a Bach thing. Uh, they, they can't keep up the old Western classical music if there is no new music to be had, like film, like video games. If they did keep to the traditional program, Mozart, for instance, there won't, there wouldn't be as much funding, I don't think. And I think it would be the old, older patrons uh, seeing it and then the younger people being rather disinterested. Now, people, I'm just going to go on a sidebar. People like uh, Two Set Violin, if you know the channel, they're a comedic duo who are, they're, they're professional violinists. And they do keep the classical, the interest in the classical music alive. But opera, I would say, safely say, uh, safely assume it is dying as an art form. And the symphony orchestra, if they don't, if they do away with video game music and film music, I think the, the symphony orchestra within the next couple hundred years could also go as an art form. All right, one more example. Um, contemporary classical music, so the modern music, not really postmodern music, even though that's that's part of it. Uh, the contemporary classical music scene is all of 20th century experimentation, change of tonality, uh, doing away with melody, um, or or uh, rethinking what melody is, rethinking what harmony and rhythm is, and and pitch centricities and all of that. Uh, contemporary classical. <clears throat> It's kind of hard to say. I can't say CCM because that's Christian, but new music, I'll just say new music. That's a synonymous term with uh, contemporary classical music. Uh, new music um, has a very, I would say as an art form, has never been culturally relevant. So the opera has been culturally relevant. The symphony orchestra has been culturally relevant. Uh, contemporary music or new music has never been culturally relevant. Um, it's just been too experimental to be 
really accepted by the masses. Uh, some people go, but the demographic is really strict. The demographic really um, is universities, uh, venues that specifically cater to the new music scene, or artists and residents who go to both, like either are artists and residents for universities, maybe they're professors themselves, or they're performers at these specific venues. So the, the new music scene has always been irrelevant, culturally speaking. And some academics don't really care. They, they think, well, that's fine. You know, uh, you know, mainstream, you know, the normie, as we say, like they, they're not clever enough to understand what we write. Um, even one, I think it was an, the American composer, Elliot Carter, he may have joked. One of the academics said he, he made it, Elliot Carter made a joke saying, well, you know, people aren't really clever enough to listen to my music and his, his stuff is modern, you know, it's, it's quite modern. Um, so some academics have the, that sentiment saying, well, we don't need the world to like our music. You know, we prefer to have our own clique, our own little, little, little group. But some people did express frustration. Um, one person says, hey, I love the new music scene, but I can't land a job. No, there's no interest outside the universities for this new music scene. And, and I would uh, just say that that's an example of they, they want the new music scene to be culturally relevant. I, I don't think it ever will be. I don't think it will ever lose or leave the university setting. There are some places in Europe where, or, or even something, someplace like New York where we have the um, Museum for Modern Art and there could be showcases of new music, uh, contemporary music like that. But on the whole, people like the traditional melody. They like the traditional harmony, whether in a rock concert in an orchestra piece, orchestral piece, uh, they just like traditional musical ideas. And so I wanted to point out that the new music scene will, I, I don't suppose it will die as an art form, um, but it's, it's uber niche. And so it will never be culturally relevant, like ever. And um, even, even people, composers like uh, Stockhausen, um, the, the German composer um, Verez, I had heard that the French composer Verez inspired Frank Zappa. So major artists might be inspired by these composers, but the composers themselves, the, the music that they wrote will never go past the, the, the doctoral dis dissertation. I wish I said that cleverly, but I didn't. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so this so that was the first angle coming from coming at this from an academic perspective. Uh, we do have major art forms that are passing away. Uh, I don't know when exactly the art form uh, would, uh, you know, the, I don't know when exactly the I can't, I can't make that educated guess when opera is going to pass on. But I don't think it's going to continue much after 100 years, 200 years from now, if it's going on this trajectory that the academics are complaining about. And um, let me grab some water. I'll, I'll say this before going into the, the second angle of, of this question. Um, one problem I had seen, not as a student, but just kind of a, per, a person who every once in a while, I'll, I'll look at an opera, you know, I'll, I'll watch an opera or listen to an aria, like a major aria. And I do see, I mean, you can go on YouTube, go, 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 you know, search on YouTube, uh, Mozart, Magic Flute, Queen of the Night. And some, the, the story of the Magic Flute is very mythical. It's, it's a very, it's like a, it's kind of an epic fairy tale. It, it's a, it's a wonderful story. I, I highly recommend the, the, the opera, the Magic Flute. And so it's very mythical. You kind of think of knights and, 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 and princesses and um, maybe something uh, with some Greek aesthetics or something with like an old medieval aesthetic. Like it's a, it's a very mythical tale. And I prefer the costuming and the setting to be very much that, that fantastical, like the princess and the prince and um, the, the evil queen and, and all that, like kind of like a Snow White feel, right? A lot of people to keep opera alive if that's the way, to keep people, like to keep young people interested in opera, 
some people have gone crazy outlandish with the costuming and the setting of something like Mozart's Queen of the Night, where like the the woman, the singer who will sing the 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 famous aria, you know, she's she's dressed like her voice is perfect, but she's dressed in such flamboyant, crazy clothes that that distracts me. That personally distracts me. But it's been a creative choice for a long time to just like, oh, let's let's do the magic flute in like an urban setting or whatever. Um, I have seen that too. And I'm not saying that's a, a completely uh, wrong route to take, but I think if people went just back to the mythos of something like the magic flute, I think that in and of itself would hold the engagement. Where it's like, no, we gotta, we gotta dress it up differently. We've gotta change the style. It's gonna be the same music, but it's gonna be like in this kind of weird cubic aesthetics, you know. And uh, we'll we'll have bright colors instead of muted wood woodland colors, and and um, and and we'll make uh, oh, what was Sarastro? I think that's his name. I, I forgot the baritone, the 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 paragon character of the magic flute. Um, he's he'll he'll be in a, a really comedic funny um maybe emasculating costume and and that'll be great because he's a baritone and we want to emasculate him and stuff oh he's not baritone actually he's like between baritone and bass if i remember so he's he's very grandfatherly he's a very grandfatherly fatherly character so anyway people are trying to keep they're trying to keep opera something like opera alive with a lot of modern takes i'm not saying that's should be completely avoided, but it shouldn't be the go-to. I, I would say, no, that's not the first thing you go to. You need to actually have something more appropriate to the setting, you know, as if, you know, it was Mozart making the opera all over again, and he would have been very, um, he'd ha had an eye for the fantastical for something like that, something like his mythical settings. Anyway, so uh, that is the first angle, the, the academic perspective. Just before I get into the second angle, some academics are frustrated that new music is not culturally relevant. They 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 want people to be educated. <laughs> and we'll I'll probably talk about this a, a little bit later, but uh, when we're in the chat. But uh it, it won't ever be. <laughs> so I'm sorry, academics. Uh, it, it just it just won't. You you you'll have to continue educating students in, in that field, but uh, not like a whole ton of people are not interested in new contemporary music. It's it's an experience when you go to a concert like that, but you don't remember anything. You just remember the experience. And now some some people in the academic space will say, "Well, that's enough." So, but. That it's not enough to be culturally relevant. All right, let me grab some water. I have two more angles, uh, two more perspectives. Water. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all right, the second angle. So the first one was from the academic perspective. The second angle is the mainstream. So what is mainstream is culturally relevant. Now we were talking, you guys were throwing that idea out there like trends, something that's that's a trend. So no matter, you know, using the example, no, no matter how much we feel, no matter um, wh whether we feel bad about it or good about it, no matter what you feel about Disney or Marvel, the comics, uh, the shows, the, the movies, no matter what you feel about that, it's still, it's on the decline, that's for sure, but it is still mainstream. It's still in the public conscience. It's still in the public sphere. Now, people, if, well, even if, let's say, let's say Warner Brothers doesn't do DC, you know, 50 years from now or whatever, or even sooner than that, depending. Superman, I think, will always be on the minds of, of the public conscience, um, uh, uh, on the minds of people. I think he will always be a thought about you know, I think the idea, and and I'm not talking about Nietzsche's Superman. I'm talking about Superman. You know, of course, the character we all love. I think even if D uh, DC stopped what it was doing, if Warner Brothers say, "Hey, just discontinue Superman," I think, I don't know. I think he's going to be always prevalent somehow, in some way. And maybe that's just me being optimistic. 
Now, what Warner Brothers in DC has been doing in the past, you know, I would say 20 or so years, definitely with, with movies and, and, and TV, but even with comics, probably because I've heard it on the grapevine <laughs> in the last 20 or so years, they, they've aimed to deconstruct Superman and, and the like, you know, people who are iconic, you know, characters and archetypes that are iconic. And the, I think the main thing for the deconstruction is so that these characters and these archetypes can be culturally irrelevant. So right now we're talking about mainstream. Everyone knows who Superman is. Everyone has an idea of what he looks like, how he speaks traditionally. Uh, and But unfortunately, within the last decade or so, especially the last 15 years, he has been put put through the ringer, the, the deconstruction ringer. And I think that's been the intention all along where the people behind Warner Brothers, people behind uh, people who despise Superman as a, as a character, they, they want him irrelevant. So the way to make him irrelevant is to deconstruct him. And I think that's the point of all types of deconstruction, at least within the mainstream media. It's uh, It's to make that thing not that not not just a beloved thing not not just something that's important to you it's just to make that thing in general removed from public conscience uh, from the public conscience uh so S superman of course is one i think obviously obviously luke skywalker is another like no one i i i'm convinced that people over at disney in the creative side i i am convinced that they do not want luke skywalker to be remembered at all they they want to make the force ne nebulous and they they want to just keep characters that are Disney created, Disney creations, and and just say, okay, Luke Skywalker, yeah, he he had a story in the universe, but he's not the story, you know. And so that was that could have been, I would say that's a that was a mode for or a reason rather that was a reason for deconstructing Luke Skywalker. They they wanted him hurt, beaten, wounded to wound the audience. To talk, you know, and we talked about, and we've talked about for a number of years now, how how this is an outrage, you know, how how we should be upset about this, and yes, we should be, uh, but I think people now forget about it. I, I do think even even people who made videos about Luke Skywalker and his deconstruction with the sequel trilogy, I, I think people are over over it. I think people have just um, moved on, you know. And, and there's still some of these people are still watching Star Wars. <laughs> so um, Ahsoka is the force. Yeah, exactly. Prof is like he he's saying exactly what what Disney's hoping everyone will say. And that is uh, well, he, he's saying that sardonically. He's not saying that uh, truthfully. Let's see if I can hit that hide. OK, <laughs> so anyway, um, deconstruction. Yeah, uh, that, that's been. That's that's the mode to make something culturally irrelevant. So this is a, a, a some, something a little shorter than the academic perspective, but just the mainstream perspective. Whatever is mainstream is what is culturally relevant, for better or for worse. So that leads me to the third angle. Should we make culturally relevant art? Now, going back to should art be culturally relevant, he's, he's still there. Ugh, there we go. Such a sensitive mouse. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk about mice. <laughs> they're cute when they stay still, like they're huddled in the little corner. But then, like when they when they move really fast, I I, I might have screamed one night. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> but I didn't stand on the chair. I didn't do that. <laughs> anyway, um, so going back to that third angle, should we make art culturally relevant? I would say make art because it's it's good for you it's good for your soul and it's good for people closest to you but i would say yes we should make culturally relevant art that should be the objective again if you're doing a personal kindness to someone um, drawing them a picture or, or painting something for a client or doing a digital artwork for a company like a, a startup company okay sure that's that's more i would say that's smaller that's more local but if you are creating stories your stories might not be famous. I'm not expecting my stories to be famous, but I would want I would want to write my stories to make them culturally relevant. And that can be done. 
with the right ingredients that can be done. Now, what are those ingredients? Well, as far as stories are concerned, uh, you write something that is a good story, that is a good idea, well executed. You know, understand pacing, understand the structure of a story, understand good prose, understand good dialogue, and then understand good character development. Those are the parameters to work with if you want to uh, engage someone or engage a group of people and have it maybe being uh, culturally relevant. Ultimately, I don't think any, well, I, I, for me personally, I, I would not think that my stories would be as ever as famous as Lord of the Rings or Star Wars. Um, but we do know what made those stories culturally relevant. Uh, as far as music is concerned, as you know, there's there's difference between future music. You know, people say, oh, the future music, like the music of the future is going to be something we don't even recognize today. You know, Hans Zimmer, actually, I, I heard an interview um, months back and he was saying that he's like, you know, this is this is what music would probably sound like in the world of Dune, uh, you know, in, in, in the world of uh, Arrakis. And and it might be so, but I don't think it's not going to be so foreign music in the future, even in the distant future, it's not going to be so foreign that it, we, we wouldn't recognize it today because we do gravitate toward things like the, the basic things, melody, harmony, good rhythm, a good feeling all around uh, things to be uh, things to remember things that we can sing off the top of our heads. If we wanted to, you know, like a good video game track. So, uh, so that's, that's an example of, well, for me, my music would only be culturally relevant if it sounds good, if it, if it, if it just gets you connected, if it gets you hyped, if it gets you uh, hooked, maybe you're working on something and you just like, I, I need to listen to Sound and Graver's music, uh, that, that will make me feel good, like in a car ride, you know, on a road trip, something like that. Th that that's within the parameters of making culturally relevant art. And I think that's important, whether it's story, the music, any kind of art form is that no, no, the parameters that have made certain art pieces long uh, last as long as they have, you know, whether it's a, po a portrait, a painting, um, a good story, you know, something like Dante's Inferno, people still talk about something like that. <laughs> uh, characters like iconic characters that we were just, Prof and I were just talking about uh, last night, uh, iconic characters like Dracula or Frankenstein. Even if you've never read, I, like I plan on reading Frankenstein this year. I do need to read that. Also Dracula. I know of Dracula. I know of Frankenstein, even if I'm not quite um, connected with, with these characters, narratively speaking, as a reader or as a listener or as a viewer of a film. But I know what they are. Like I, I know what they represent, especially Dracula. So that, so if you know what goes into a story like Frankenstein, chances are you can have a culturally relevant piece of art. And I think that's the most important uh, theme for my stream today. So I think that's everything. And, and one last final thing is how can you make your art culturally relevant? It's got to come from a place of artistic merit. It can't be mediocre. It's got to be well done. It's got to be created by you, by, by, by your own acumen, your own set of skills, your own knowledge of the, the medium. And that alone will be the foundation to inspire people. If you present a good piece of art and, and people have that as their preference, you know, to go to for reading a story or seeing a film, then, then you're good to go. So I think that's everything for my notes. In fact, I could probably just uh, get out of that and shut down my computer. There. Uh, one second here, too. I'm going to get straight into the chat. Just one tiny second. All right. All right. Let's see what y'all are saying now. Dig Outlaw says Magic Flute is on. It's on your playlist for writing inspiration. Well, that's cool. 
That's great. It's a it's a pretty it's a pretty impactful opera. I I remember being, uh, yeah, I remember enjoying it when I when I saw it. Uh, the the opera that I actually, if you've never been to an opera and you have the 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 means to go to an opera, whether it's a really well done film and you're in a theater watching it, or even an actual opera, I will say, I, I would I would encourage people to never say I don't like opera until they in, until they've gone to an opera then they can say it because there is something about seeing an opera and seeing people sing very very well that it kind of moves you like I remember seeing uh Donizetti's I think that's his name Donizetti's Donizetti's Lucia di Lamamor and it's about a, a woman a soprano uh, who falls in love but circumstances happen and then she descends into madness and her madness scene I was like right up front I was a student we we're all on the in a classroom going to the same show and we were right up front and she <laughs> I'll just describe it she she's she's cutting her wrists and the knife actually did display like what looked like real blood of course because it's so well staged and and she was she was singing as the knife pricked her skin like she was t it was tickling her even though she's hurting herself she but she's mad she um you know she doesn't have any uh, cognition of, of oh, this is painful. No, it's tickling her. And her notes were so colorful and so high. And then at the very end of her mad scene, she faints and, and, and falls into like, like two, like the arms of two people. And she hits an E flat that is not the E flat above middle C. Oh. <laughs> I, I haven't warmed up. Um, uh, it, but it's the higher one. <laughs> And I'm not going to try it, but it's, it's it's crazy high. It's like it's two E flats ab above middle C. And um, she hit it so well. And I was floored with awe. And uh, I wasn't even crazy about the story. It was just the singing that really gripped me. Um, and I was right in front of her. Like I was I was looking up and it was oh, the way she hit those notes. Was like, whoa. <laughs> um, so anyway, Big Al presents says uh hit that thumbs up button hit that like hit that like button uh if you're if you're not subscribed subscribe to my channel um i never do call to action and the more i see my numbers on youtube i'm like man i probably should say things like excuse me things like hit like uh subscribe if you like this content because it's like i do have a lot of people coming in who are not subscribed so if you're not subscribed and you appreciate my content go ahead and Subscribe. I'll say it. Slava's in. Good to see you. Uh, what's good, SE? Thank you for calling me SE. Um, everything's good. Everything's wonderful. I'm having a great day. We we caught both both mice. Uh, we we might have more mice, but we caught both of them, so that's good. All right, let's uh, go all the way up. See what you guys are saying. Let's see. Samuel Proctor says, I'd say it's not required to be culturally relevant. It's more of an option. Um, uh, oh, you say Lord of the Rings was published in the 50s. I wonder why I thought it was the 60s. Oh, wait a second. I think he's like, I think Tolkien was in his 60s when he got the books, when he had the books published. I think he was like 62 when Fellowship came out. That's very inspiring. Some of the symphonies, um, who was it? Was it Schumann? I can't remember. One of the German sim sim symphony composers. Um, he didn't publish his, he didn't uh, premiere his first symphony until he was like 40 or 42. And that's always encouraging. You know, you, you it's never too late to start. It's never too late. But yeah, I think Tolkien was, I, if I remember correctly, he was in his 60s when the books came out. Yeah, that would be true, too. I think he was born 18, like the last decade. I think he was born the last decade of the 1800s, which is kind of weird to think about. All right. Um, Junk says, this is very true. To this day, a lot of my art boards still create work based on Lord of the Rings. The first Blade Runner... The thing, etc. Well, that's a that's a very interesting combination. That's cool. 
That's cool. Uh, Brian says, uh, Sound of by the definition you're giving, you could say many video games uh, deemed retro could be considered culturally relevant since people still seek them out to play. I, I have a good idea about that. Uh, and you also say, even with current generations uh, boasting better processing power and graphics uh, capabilities. Okay, so yeah, I was actually just thinking about that like not even 20 minutes before the stream, Brian. Um, so we, ha we have retro games. Like I think the perfect example is Chrono Trigger. Even if you've never played Chrono Trigger, if you're a gamer, you know what Chrono Trigger is, like, or you you've heard the name. And one of it, one of the reasons is because it's great gameplay and it's a wonderful story. But what makes it such a transcendental experience, like transcending the normal everyday experience, is the music. The music is wonderful. Uh, and I think music, especially for video games, I I think, and this is true of film too. Uh, but with video games, especially retro video games, uh, you just, that helps. That aids the game's longevity. Like, Chrono Trigger, isn't isn't it like 30 years old now? I can't remember. Was it 1994? I can't remember when it was released in North America, at least, or, or Japan. But um, it's it's a few decades old, and it's it still holds up. Like, the graphics are wonderful. Like, the original Super... I know they recently remade uh, Mario and the Seven Stars, which actually is a very good remake. I I appreciated it a lot. I'm going to always go back and forth between the original and then the remake because I actually like them both. Uh, I like them both a lot. There were a couple creative choices I didn't care for as far as the new remake, but all around, it's, I'll, I'll definitely be revisiting that, that remake game. Um, now they remade the game, but the, the original holds, like if someone said, Hey, um, uh, I, you've played Mario seven stars. Do you, should I play the original if I have it? Or should I play the remake? I'm like, only play the remake if you don't have any other option it, because it's actually, it's, it really stays true to the original, but if you have the original play the original, it's, it holds up the gameplay, the graphics, the story, the, the I would say the music, uh, I'll say this about the music for Mario, uh, seven stars. I like uh, Yoko Shimomura's music and her original synthesis synthesizer orchestration better than the remake. I, I think the orchestration for the remake is good. I, I prefer, I, I do prefer uh, the uh, the original. There there was a lot more edge to it, and I I I like that. Um, another great example is um, David Wise uh, his his aquatic ambience from the first Donkey Kong film or game, Donkey Kong Country. You know, it was made in the 90s and it still holds up as the best version of that song. Oh, peace. It's not a song. There are no words. Um, but it's the it's the best. Like so many people have done beautiful covers. I would love to do a violin cover, like a violin electronic cover years down the road of aquatic ambience. And I even I know even if I could made it so beautiful it still does not, it would not hold a candle to, am I using that phrase correctly? It would just not compare to the original because it, it was so well done. Like David Wise, whatever he did for Aquatic Ambience was perfect. It's like it's like 10 out of 10, maybe 11 out of 10. I think I gave it a 10 out of 10. It's just perfect. Uh, and, and no new technology, no new instrumentation can replace that. It, I, I'm fine with, li uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I am fine with listening to uh, covers. I love listening to video game covers from different people. Um, and some are really good. Some I really enjoy, but it still it still does not replace the quality of those, really those first three games, those, those uh, uh, DKC 1, 2, and 3. Like <laughs> all the compositions and all the instrumentation is so good. And that's kind of what I regret a little bit about Mario, not Mario, but um, uh, the 64, um, not just the Donkey Kong game, but it's, it's just, it had more capacity, uh, but the, the soundtracks just weren't the same. Uh, you know, the 64 soundtracks, I, I would actually, no, I would say the Mario 64 soundtrack is pretty good uh, for what it is, but um, anyway. That was a little bit of a sidebar, but you're right about the retro games. It's like people say, oh, we should have a Chrono Trigger remake. I'm like, I would love a Chrono Trigger remake if it's true to the, the game, but I don't need it. That's the thing is I would love to have it, but I don't need it. Um, it's it's 
it's a perfect game. <laughs> it really is. Andreas is here. Uh, hello, Sound Engraver. What is the most important topic that will be discussed today? Should art be culturally relevant? That is the topic. Samuel Proctor says, one thing producers in the studio systems era of Hollywood didn't did to stay to stay relevant was to take inspiration from multiple store uh, multiple sources dramatic newspaper articles um hit books or plays yeah interesting yep uh studio system era of hollywood i'm not sure exactly that era uh maybe you can confirm what what years you're talking about all right continuing on down Brian makes the, the really important point that government funding, I mean, it's not only limited, but it could just be abused to spread po propaganda. Yeah. And, and art is a, it's like a Petri dish <laughs> for that kind of stuff. It's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> Elias Jones says, you can't enjoy Shakespeare until you've heard it in the original Klingon. I hardly know what Klingon. I, I probably should watch Star Trek. I mean, I'm I'm so into Stargate now, but maybe I'll be into Star Trek later. But I hardly know what Klingon sounds like. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Junk says, as someone from outside looking in, opera will come back just like how uh, synth did. Uh, it, it has stigma that only the rich can appreciate opera, which leaves it to be ripe, uh, leaves it ripe to be deconstructed. So the whole thing that opera is only for the rich, uh, modern art is only for the rich to buy and stuff. A lot of people, and this is kind of unfair to art in general, but even to modern art or contemporary art, a lot of people stigmatize art or modern art rather because of the whole this is for the rich to buy or opera is for the rich to see. Now opera really shouldn't be expensive to go to if, if that can be helped, but it's, it's a, it's an expensive production. Uh, what my mom did for the longest time, I don't know if they still do it, but there was, I think the metropolitan opera, that company, I think they actually did theatrical releases of a very well filmed opera. So the tickets for the film would be really expensive because it's still a highly, you know, produced thing. It, not like a movie, but um, it would be like going to an opera, but just for a fraction of the price because it's so well done. It's like on the big screen, perfect sound system, sound quality. Um, and I can't remember what the ticket price was, but my mom used to do that a lot just to, you know, she couldn't always fly to out to New York or whatever and, and see the people in person, you know, that, that, that requires some, some, some coin. So I don't know if they still do that, but you know, if, if, if an opera is released in a local theater, uh, I think by the Metropolitan, that would be a good thing to see. But again, you can also just see on YouTube if the sound is good. You have to make sure the sound is good. Hit that thumbs up, says my wonderful prof. Yeah, Andrea says, um, are you talking about the game, the Mario game? Uh, the Switch, that's what I love about the, the new version. Uh, Let's you switch battle styles. Um, oh, wait, you're probably talking about a different game, but in the Mario remake, you can switch party members in the middle of battle. So if you, if like one of your party members dies, you can switch them out for like the two, two people that were not otherwise in the battle. Uh, that's pretty cool. I would probably miss that in the original. Like, oh, I can't do that. Like once I'm dead, I'm, I better have my pick me ups and my, my, my comebacks. <laughs> uh, so. Junk says, when Superman hits public domain, these who stick to his original creation will always rise to the top and re revitalize his presence. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, time will tell. So I would hope that is the case. Slav says, I don't think the developers want to make Superman irrelevant by deconstruction. Uh, they, de con they deconstruct him, ergo making him and his ideal ideas irrelevant. Luke is a different story, though. Um, oh, well, how is Luke, Luke different from, I, I do think they try to make Luke irrelevant. Like they, they're pushing him to the, the side. Maybe that's what you mean by the difference. I think the, I, I don't, I just don't think a lot of people like Superman, you know, um, 
like mainstream guys, I don't think they like Superman. I think they would prefer that he either is not around, that he doesn't exist, or he exists in a different version. Same with Batman. Um, people people love a brooding, vengeful Batman, which I'm I'm not sure why. <laughs> I find it crazy inspirational that Batman is in the darkness, being the light. Like so great. Anyway, but. Yeah, Lynn Green says Ahsoka's Dave Filoni's self-insert fanfic. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen to her character. I, I really do think the enthusiasm is going down. I think people are watching the new Disney shows. Not everyone. I can't speak for everyone. But I get the sense from some people on YouTube. I, I get the sense that they're just watching now out of habit. Like, well, I can't not watch Star Wars because I've been watching Star Wars all this time. <laughs> It's like, go for it. Go, go, go to the bakery, you know, get a cupcake, <laughs> do something else. You don't have to watch Star Wars. <laughs> just, just tell yourself, okay, instead of watching Star Wars, I'll knit a sweater, <laughs> you know. Andrea says Disney doesn't care for real Star Wars. I don't think so either. Yeah, actually, uh, Chunk, Chunk, you make a really good point. You say if you aim for perfection, your worst outcome will always be excellence. And that is true. I, I'm actually struggling. I don't know if it's perfectionism, but I've got this. I've got a couple tracks done for my music and the, the instruments, they just need a little bit of mastering work and it'll be ready. But these tracks I have in mind to record violin and this one one track, it's got so much energy. Uh, my, my prof loves it. Um, it's called, I'm calling it desert solace. And, um, and it sounds like it's in a desert. It's great. It's got those tones. Um, he loves it. He loves the bass and the percussion is really, it's, it's highly energetic. Um, and it's got an energy to it. And when I recorded the violin over it, it's, I haven't looked at it yet. I haven't looked at my part yet, but, um, I feel like the violin actually has pulled the energy down and I'm struggling with that because I don't want, I don't want that energy to go down. Uh, and I feel like record that whatever violin I recorded is like, oh, man, am I, am I just overthinking it? It's, it's kind of a perfectionist tendency, but I was like, I don't want the energy to go down. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Uh, I am struggling with a little bit of that. There goes some water. Did you guys see that? That waterfall? I'm a terrible drinker. <laughs> All right. So um, let's uh, continue on down. Sound Engraver is a fake monster fan. Confirmed. It's all over. I don't know yet. I haven't read Dracula or Frankenstein. Um, I th This has nothing to do with Dracula or Frankenstein. But um, I loved, I loved, it's probably one of my favorite stories out there. I loved Something Wicked This Way Comes from Ray Bradbury. It was, it's, it's going down as one of my favorite stories to read. And I'll, I'll revisit that story. Um, it, but, uh, and it's got some monsters in it per se, but the, the concepts are different. Very different. Uh, <laughs> Andrea says, I don't know if my stories will be popular like, Lord, why well, I, I know they won't be popular like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. Like if, if that if that happened, that would just be amazing. But it doesn't. It just I I know why they wouldn't be. But I know why they would make at least even if they're not popular, they have the my stories would have the parameters of popularity. What what is to come? That is only by chance, a little bit of luck, a little bit of marketing. <laughs> A little bit of promotion <laughs> and we'll see. And if people love it, then they'll talk about it. And then that's, that's what will happen. <laughs> uh, but you say, uh, I mean, one can dream sound engraver. Yeah. I mean, of course that'd, that'd be awesome. But then you'd be all harassed though. Like, Hey, can we make, can we make your story a movie? 
And then if you don't have any, or if you have limited rights to your stories uh, or to the ad- adaptation, I was like, I don't, I don't think I would want my stories to be adapted in this climate. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would personally want amazing fame, <laughs> like, like Lord of the Rings. But then again, I, I don't control that. That's, that's a matter of chance, luck or whatever. So, I mean, cause Tolkien himself, I'm not comparing myself to Tolkien, but he, he didn't write Lord of the Rings knowing it was going to be famous. <laughs> he didn't know it was going to be a cultural phenomena. Um, Samuel says, what if hypothetically I had said I'd never heard of Chrono Trigger? Well, I mean, it's, it's a retro game, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good chance you haven't heard it, but Chrono Trigger's amazing. It's like, it's like A tier retro. All right, let's move on down. Amy L, good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, you're uh, Samuel Pro- uh, Proctor. You're confirming it was back when the producers had more power in film production. The actors and theaters had contracts that made him uh, ma- made them exclusive to certain studios. Oh, okay. All right. Slav says, I don't know why academia is um, hell bent on postmodern traditions such as deconstruction. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, we started uh, exiting out of postmodernism in the late '90s. It is true that that's that that's a really good point. I don't know where you are as far as the art world. Um, are you a visual artist or musician? Um, are, had you been in the academics? Um, you're 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 right about that. You know, postmodernism and and its effects really. Well, with music, it's, you got modern and you got postmodern, and it can be a little bit ambiguous. Um, and I'd have to read up specific timelines, but postmodernism, um, with the different methods and approaches to music composition, I, I would say, oh man, it could be it could be a little general. I'm going to say, I, I will definitely say after World War II. Modern was before World War II. And then getting into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you're you're working with a lot of different new sentiments, especially in the 60s. Um, but, you know, that really did phase out I, for music, probably not even the 90s. I would say early 80s for, for contemporary music. But then the 21st century, I've even seen programs, musical programs saying, this is the 20th century. This is the 21st century. 21st century new music and then it's like if you ever go to a university concert at least in the united states you'll know what i'm talking about where it sounds pretty much the same and i know i know professors would balk at that they're like how dare you say that that not every student composition sounds the same it's like they might be working with different parameters and different ideas and different concepts but if if there's no flow if there's no trajectory if there's no conflict if there's no narrative and if everything sounds irrelative, it's going to sound all the same. You know, I've made this point so many times, but you're right, Slav. I think, I think postmodernism, at least in the, I, I can't speak for the visual art world, but music speaking, musically speaking, I think it really d- did end like toward the eighties, like definitely by end of seventies. And um, now 21st century composers, they're just kind of taking inspiration from Carter and Stockhausen. Well, Stockhausen. I don't know. I wouldn't call. Uh, he's. I gotta be careful with the term postmodernism because Stockhausen is not. He's not a postmodernistic composer. I wouldn't even say a lot of the famous composers are postmodern. They just they're working with principles that could be postmodern. Not always. Not all the time. But yeah. So I gotta be careful with postmodern. That word. Um, All right. Lynn Green says, uh, Acolyte actually made more dislikes than likes on the trailer. It's going to flop. I don't think it's, I don't think, the thing is that if it flops, it doesn't matter because the Ahsoka show flopped, but people are still, people are still watching it. People are going to, people are going to watch the Acolyte. Like you really should punish the person making the Acolyte. You know, if she has her 
allegations, if she has her legal uh, accusations, um, punish her by not watching her stuff. You know, if she's if she is associated with Harvey Weinstein and you're mad at him, like like the liberals are, punish her. If she has connections, punish her. Don't watch it. But pe- I'm not saying that to you, Lynn Green, but people are going to watch it. It's like, yeah, we're going to really punish her by telling her how bad it is. Like, she's going to love. That's actually, that's a that's a postmodern idea, actually. People will would love for the audience to hate their craft, to hate their work. It's like, well, at least I'm getting something visceral out of you. Anyway, I'm going to scroll on down a little bit because uh, I, I didn't take a walk before the stream. And I would actually like to take my daily walk uh, after the stream before it gets dark. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these comments a little bit. Ghost Planet uh, says that you worry about Superman becoming public domain because of nihilistic people who ruined Win- Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, Steamboat Willie was kind of like people are being stupid about it. That I think that stunt. Well, here's the thing. Let me give you a little dose of optimism here. Even if they did that originally with something, someone like Superman, I think that would just be a stupid phase. And I think that would go away. And people who would be re- really serious, like really serious to do a good Superman story, they would just take their time. Maybe it would take a year. Maybe it would take two years. Maybe it would take a, a campaign and a, a, like a series of campaigns of independent support for like five years to produce a beautiful Superman comic that would absolutely take over any attention that, that like a nihilistic Superman got. So um, yeah, I'm not crazy about what's happened with Steamboat Willie and Wiener the Pooh. I mean, it's, it's so dumb. It's just, but I don't think that stuff lasts. I think that that's just a fad. It's like, it's like something to talk about for a week before moving on. I mean, if you, let's say you had, so Winnie the Pooh is public domain and then some game developer developed this masterful children's game, whether a computer game or a game involving a console. And it's, it, the art is beautiful. The music is precious. Um, well done. The animation, the, the aesthetics, the gameplay, that something like that would outperform and outlast any stupid stuff, any stupid stunts um, that that you see on the internet. So where am I on the public domain? I don't know. I, to be honest, I'd have to give it a lot more thought. So don't ask. <laughs> All right. I got to scroll through some of these comments. Um. On the public domain thing, Samuel does say, uh, is that anyone can use it. Those that love it, hate it, and, and trolls. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, here's the thing. I Just going back to that point, I think good art transcends a lifetime. Like, one reason why I would want to produce good art or good music, um, and especially good stories. I don't, like, the... the I don't think my electronic music would outlast me. That'd be wonderful if it did. Uh, it would actually have to, to be honest, I'd have to compose for a project, like a, like a visual novel or an animated series or something. Like I'd have to have, I think my music would have to be for something else to, to make it outlast me. And I, I don't say that like flippantly or, or with any um, uh, resentment or anything. I just, my style is just, it's, it's just different. It's eclectic and and I enjoy producing what I do on my own time, uh, on my own terms. With stories, though, um, I w- would want my story to outlast me. Uh, that is for sure. So anyway, uh, let's see. All right. I think that's everything. Um Oh, you do say Slav says uh, Golden Age Superman is what will be the public domain. Not all of Superman's lore. Yeah. That, hey, that's true, too. But then again, like, just do, do what the great independent artists are doing and just, you know, make up your own stuff. Yeah, there's there's definitely an expectation. But I think it'd be a fun project. Uh, uh, I, had, I had the thought, like, what, what character? I feel like there was a character I would really enjoy doing a, a, a public domain story of and I totally forgot <laughs> so oh well 
but I, I've got my own story. So anyway, um, let's, uh, I would say I, I really would like to take a walk. So we'll go ahead and end it there. Um, I really enjoyed the stream. Hopefully, I know I talked a little bit more about the academics, but again, it's always art. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, what else? Um, I might not have a video this coming week for YouTube because I just want to compose. <laughs> I just want to spend every free second I have uh, composing. Um, if I'm not making dinner, if I'm not cleaning, and it's late at night. I'm just gonna I'm gonna want to compose or write my story. So I probably won't have a video this time around. But anyway, um, thank you guys so much for watching and listening. And um, until I see you next, keep producing, preserving, and promoting that great art that you love. And I will see you later. <laughs>